All right, this lecture is going to be on component identification. So we're going to go through uh, multiple different kinds of components that we use in electronics or just, you know, in electricity in general. Um, different types of resistors, capacitors, LEDs, uh, things like that. Multimeter, a tool that we use to uh, read them with. So uh, a lot of basics we're going to do here. You're going to be using over the next couple of years here in the mechatronics program. Uh, when we take apart the trainers, you're going to have to uh, be able to take readings using the multimeter to do some troubleshooting and different aspects like that. So all these are uh, things that you're going to get used to using in here a lot. When we do a lot of breadboarding coming up, you're going to be uh, using a lot of these components when you control your circuit. So let's take a look at the first one here. This is a resistor. Okay very fundamental to electronics, electricity, and everything. So in the upper right hand corner, that's a picture of a, what a resistor physically looks like. All right, uh, that's not what every resistor in the world is going to look like, that we have different ones we're going to talk about here shortly. But in general, if you see that, you know, it's got bands of color on it, those mean something. We're going to learn how to read those. And then up in the upper left hand left hand corner that's the symbol for a resistor so when we start looking at electrical drawings and schematics and things like that we're always going to draw them using that symbol in the upper left hand corner all right so understanding you know what the what resistor physically looks like and what the resistor symbol looks like on a piece of paper for drawing out a circuit all right so it's very important that we understand because we're going to be using both of those so what's the point of a resistor a resistor is limiting the flow of electrical current. It's limiting the flow of electrons. Okay, so we can use that to control how much current. All right, so if you think about uh, at your house and you have a light where you can dim it, all right, and there's a little switch on the wall or a slide or a knob, and you can turn that, you're changing the resistance, all right, and that resistance allows more current to flow so your light's really bright or less current to flow. Uh, so that uh, your light is a little bit more dim. Same when you're controlling the screen on your cell phone or things like that. All right, so we're controlling the current. Now we've talked about this in the last lecture, but the symbol for resistance is that Greek capital omega. All right, and the unit of resistance we call ohms. So I'm going to say, hey, we got a 25 ohm resistor, or we have a 10,000 ohm resistor, or a, a 2.7 kilo ohm resistor. All right, so that way we know what component we're talking about, so we give it that SI tag of ohms. Okay, so remember, resistors measured in unit of ohms, okay, capital uh, omega in Greek, that's what the symbol is on the screen here, uh, named after Gregor Ohm, all right, he, is, uh, he developed a fundamental law that you will be using the next couple of years, uh, that we have a whole separate lecture for that one. Uh, using Ohm's law and the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. All right, so we have different resistor types. All right, um, and part of it's the material uh, that they're made from as well. Most resistors are carbon material. All right, if we take a look at the ones in the upper left-hand corner here, uh, we got four bands. The first three colors determine the size of the resistor. And when I say size, I don't mean its physical size, like how um, big it is. You know, is it as big as your fist, or is it as big as a pencil, or that? Not the, not its physical side, but but its resistance size. Most resistors are all physically the same size, but based on what they do with the carbon is how they changed how much current can actually flow through there. All right, so we need to understand that too when we're talking about resistors. It's not a physical size; it's a resistive size that's done with how they handle the carbon and how the carbon kind of filters how much current can roll through. All right, on the right hand side, we have variable resistors. A Couple different kinds of variable resistors. Uh, the first one that you kind of see there with its symbol in the upper right hand corner, the blue one with the, where you turn it with a screwdriver. Okay, it's a variable resistor because I can change the different levels of resistance in that one. That particular one is called a potentiometer and we use that one to regulate voltage. Okay, so potentiometers are variable resistors that uh, you can change it, change what's happening to the voltage. Where a rheostat, which we're going to talk about later on um, in the electrical class for mechatronics, all right, that one controls current. So 
we have those different sort of things. So your thermostat in your house uses a variable resistor. Your stereo, when you control the sound, uses a variable resistor. All those different types of things. All right. In the bottom right-hand corner, we have surface mount resistors. Those carry the same value as the carbon film resistors. However, those are like what are in your electronics, so on your motherboard of your computer or on your cell phone or things like that. They don't, they're not very big physically. And we'll have some in class that I can pass around so that you're going to see the difference in the size, the physical size of the carbon film resistors versus the surface mount carbon resistors. Uh, huge, 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 huge difference. Um, that's why we can fit thousands of those onto a motherboard or in your cell phone or those sort of things. Okay. If we take a look at physical size comparison, all right, so if we look at, you know, there's a really big resistor that's sitting at the top here. It's still small, right? We're comparing it to the size of a dime. But what the difference is between those different resistors, they might all have the same resistor value, but they are physically because they can handle different power consumption. So we might have a quarter watt resistor, a half watt resistor, a one watt resistor. They can handle more power going through them, handling larger currents and voltages and things like that. So that's why there's a difference in physical size there, um, not just necessarily resistive size. Because those little itty bitty resistors at the bottom of the picture here, the surface mount resistors, those can still carry the same size of resistance as that one at the very top. All right, they're just designed a little differently because they go on board electronics and things like that. You're going to find those in your Xbox, your Nintendo, your PlayStation, your phone, all those different. Anything with electronics, most likely, you're going to have the surface mount ones. Okay, uh, we're going to get to the resistor code here in a second. Uh, that's how we actually physically know what the, not physically know, but know what the resistor size is. Whether it's a 10 ohm resistor, a 100 ohm resistor, a 10,000 ohm resistor. Uh, those colors do mean something. And those are hard to see. We'll do a lab in class where we have to, I give you some resistors and you tell me what size resistor it is. It's tough to see some of those colors. and uh, They're very, very small and hard to see. So we can use what's on the right hand side there is a digital multimeter so we can use that multimeter and it's called a multimeter because we can read multiple things we can read AC voltage we can read DC voltage we can read um, different resistor values we can read current we can read continuity which means hey is there a break in the in the wire or not uh, we can also use uh, resistor values or resistive values to read if a circuit is open or closed just like we can continuity so there's some different things there you know and that that meter can handle you know different levels of voltages and different levels of current and we're going to use this a lot of different hands-on uh, with that in class so by the time you're through the program you should know very well how to use a digital multimeter you're gonna we're gonna use it a little bit this year to troubleshoot and be able to kind of piggyback and find where our breadboarding went wrong um, but for the most part we're going to use it a lot uh, when we get into that uh, electrical fundamentals class that we're going to get into next year alright so how do we read a resistor's coat alright so it's color coat so always start at the end opposite silver or gold that's the tolerance so you'll notice that there'll be kind of three bands close together and one that's kind of off on its own that's usually gold or silver we always read that last, so I would always put that on the right-hand side, and then we'll read it like a book. We're going to lead it left to right. All right, so on the tests and quizzes and things like that, I'm going to give you the color code. And then I'm going to say I'm going to give you, like, a different resistor's band colors, and you're going to be able to tell me what the resistor's value is based on those band colors. All right, so notice for this resistor, there's one, two three bands okay so the first band and the second band give us the digits okay the third band is a multiplier or what I like to say that tells us the number of zeros uh, that go after the first two digits and then the last band is the tolerance okay when they design these if it's a 10 ohm resistor and it's got five percent tolerance okay it can be 5% below 10 ohms and 5% above 10 ohms. 
Let's use 100 ohms so it's a little easier for you to understand. If I have a 100 ohm resistor and I have 5% tolerance, it means when I go to take a reading on that resistor, it can go anywhere from 95 ohms up to 105 ohms. And we still consider it a 100 ohm resistor because it's tough for them to get that exact value uh, of the resistance when they're messing with all the different carbon and actually designing those. So when we take a look at this, this resistor is orange, white, green, and then it has a gold tolerance. So if we take a look at that, orange, looking at the chart, underneath the first band is a 3. White underneath the second band is a 9. So we know it's a 3, 9. And then green is the multiplier. It says 100K. Or what I like to see, I use the first digit and say, all right, I'm going to put five zeros after that. All right, so it's a 3, 9 with five zeros or 390,000 ohms, okay? Very large resistor right there, and then we have plus or minus 5% on the end of either side of that. All right, moving forward here. Let's do another one. This one is, and you can pause the video here and maybe try it on your own and see if you get it right. Okay, but let's take a look. We have the first band is brown, the second band is black and the third band is red and our fourth band all over on its own is uh, gold so that's a five percent tolerance all right so when we write this answer out here uh, brown is one black is zero so I'm gonna have a one and a zero and then red is two that's how many zeros I'm gonna put at the end so I'm gonna have one zero and then zero zero so I end up having a thousand ohm resistor or one kilo ohm resistor plus or minus five percent so please don't forget the tolerance when we do that so the ten comes from the brown and the black the first two digits okay and then the one hundred or the red being twos means that I put two zeros after the first two digits that I have so that's why it's one zero 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 so hundred ohms plus or minus five percent or we can say in SI that 1,000 becomes 1 kilo ohm plus or minus 5%. Okay, so let's, this is the first one we did, orange, white, green. Okay, so orange is 3, white is 9, green means 5 zeros. So this ends up being, all right, 3.9 mega ohms. We could say, uh, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. You could say 3,900 kilo ohms if you wanted to, but we try to get it down to the best engineering uh, term possible. So 3.9 mega ohms plus or minus 5%. All right, so remember, orange is the first number. White is the second number here. All right, so that's where the 3.9 comes from. Green tells us how many zeros uh, to put after it. We put five zeros after those first two digits. All right, so let's go the other direction now. Say I give you a 1.5 kilo ohm resistor plus or minus 5%. And I ask you, what are the colors going to be for this one? So what I would do is rewrite that 1.5 kilo ohms as 1,500 and kind of work backwards uh, if you want to, or you can still work left or right, whatever works for you. If you write that out as 1,500, the first digit is a 1. A 1 is what? Brown. The second digit is a 5. A 5 is equivalent to green there. So we have brown, green, and then we're looking for the color that has two zeros. The color that has two zeros is red, all right, because red is two. So we will have brown, green, red, and since it's plus or minus 5%, that will be gold. All right, so I will expect you to be able to do this one on a test. So the 1 is equivalent to brown, the 5 is equivalent to green, the two zeros that are left over are equivalent to red, and then 5% tells me that it's gold, and the picture here is physically what that resistor looks like if I were to hand it to you in class. That's what it's going to look like um, for you. It's good um, when we do this in class to get the magnifying glass app for your cell phone so that you can zoom in or use your camera, zoom in, take a picture, and then do that to uh, take the test because that, that one can get tricky especially some of you guys that are colorblind uh, and things like that those aren't nice and distinct and far apart all right so how do we use the multimeter I'm going to show you how to do this in class as well 
Um, but we turn the multimeter. Notice there's a toggle switch in the middle. You can't quite see the values on here very well, but we're going to turn that to resistance. And we're going to have multiple labs where we use this. We're going to have multiple labs. And when we measure resistance, we actually physically have to take the resistor out of the circuit. So you never measure resistance of a res component while it's inside the circuit. Okay. We can measure a circuit to see if it's open or closed when everything's together. That's a little different for troubleshooting methods. But when I give you a multimeter and hand you a resistor in class, you're going to turn it to ohms. And there's different levels of ohms of how strong the meter can read. So we're going to turn it to what we kind of think. All right. And then you're going to take one end lead of the multimeter on one leg of the resistor and put the other end of the multimeter, so like the black leg onto, or the black lead onto the right leg of the resistor, all right, and we're going to take a reading across the resistor. We're also going to be using multi-sim in here, and I'll show you how to use the uh, onboard digital multimeter when we start using the software to develop all of our circuits as well. Another very, very important component we're going to talk about is a capacitor, all right. The picture in the upper right hand corner is what a capacitor looks like. They do not all look like that and we're going to go through uh, different kinds of capacitors. There's two different symbols for a capacitor. The one in the upper left hand corner is for an electrolytic capacitor which means it's polarized. It matters which side's negative, which side is positive. So that diagram in the upper left hand corner, the symbol all right, that's what we're going to use on drawings along with resistors and voltages and LEDs and those sort of things on a schematic. That'll all make sense once we start doing that. But if you can see the picture on the upper right hand side here, the capacitor there that says uh, the green one. If you notice there's a black stripe down it with a negative and it touches the lead that's coming out the end, that's the negative side of the capacitor. Polarity matters. If you put the capacitor in backwards, the circuit will not work. So that's very, 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 very important. All right, uh, capacitors, what are, what's their job? Their job is to store a charge. They are not a battery, all right? So you're not gonna charge something like that and it's not gonna sit there and give you constant power. It's a one-time charge. I want you to think of things like a taser, okay? A taser uses a capacitor. So when you charge up the taser, taser you're charging up the capacitor. When you shoot it out and you hit, someone with it, it dissipates that charge into them and shocks them, but it's only temporary and it stops once the capacitor's done everything out. We use that to save lives. We use a defibrillator, all right, to jump start your heart. That's just a giant capacitor that's in there and you put it on each side and you give someone a charge. A uh, common one for you guys is in your car stereos. If you have a subwoofer and a very powerful uh, amplifier and things like that in your stereo, you use a capacitor to uh, filter out so the battery doesn't drain. Sometimes you draw too much power and it makes the battery drain really quickly and uh, your electronics can shut off because of overpowering. But if you use a capacitor that charges up and it can discharge and charge really fastly, uh, it can keep your uh, everything running smoothly in your vehicle so that you have a really good sound system going on. All right, so we're going to use capacitors a lot. Uh, we're going to do a lot of soldering with them and uh, do different components with a 555 timer with those and be able to kind of use and understand what a capacitor is doing. Your touch screen on your telephone is all capacitor based so you're changing all the different voltage levels so as you slide your finger down your phone okay you're using a bunch of different capacitors uh, as you're doing that when you click on an app or those sort of things. Okay, uh, Capacitance the unit for capacitance is a farad. It's named after Michael Faraday. Uh, he did a lot of different experiments with magnetism and those sort of things. So the unit is a farad, but we use a capital F for the symbol. So I might have a, a 6.5 microfarad capacitor. Uh, if you're using your car though, you might have like a 1 farad or a 10 farad. Farad is a really large unit. Most of the capacitors that we're going to use are in um, microfarads or nanofarads and they will they really pack a punch uh, they're in your TVs your monitors things like that uh, chances are your TV screen goes bad you just go replace a capacitor I'll show you guys how to do that or talk about it a little bit in class um, but you can see where a capacitor bubbles up 
uh, and you can open your TV up see which capacitors are bad and replace them very simple process uh, for that capacitors also have the other symbol that we see here look look to the left of the ceramic disc capacitors in the upper left hand part of your screen okay just two parallel lines put together those capacitors they're okay they're not polarized so it doesn't matter which way I put that capacitor in um, with the leads the bottom ones the electrolytic ones those are polarized it does matter which direction the capacitor gets put in all right why do we have different capacitors well different materials all right so the little ones that look like Advil's up there those are ceramic disc capacitors and it's how they layer the ceramic pieces between metal pieces and that's how it holds the charge the electrolytic capacitors that you see down below they're around cylinders all right that's usually something like foil carbon foil carbon foil carbon or things like that and then they roll it up like a fruit roll up all right and that's how they store the charge all right between the metal plates and uh, we get into that more in the, in the electronic component class uh, as we do that okay and then the upper right hand corner the monolithic ceramic uh, they use tantalum things like that just different materials that help store different charges um, basically it just kind of depends on an environment that that capacitor is going to be in and sometimes it's better for us to have a, a you know that type of material because of the environment so it doesn't overheat these things can get hot and those sort of things remember heat is bad for electronics they don't function well in the heat so we want to make these guys who pack a big punch with a large charge to be small but we still got to be able to do that all right we also have surface mount capacitors exactly like we had surface mount resistors uh, the size in here is not deceiving they get very very small think about the touch screen on your cell phone or when your touch screen on your TV or your uh, your monitor for your computer same concept all right you're pushing all these little capacitors you're not physically pushing the capacitor but as you touch the screen it closes the circuit on the capacitor and it charges and discharges as you're doing that so I'll pass around in class the surface mount capacitors so you guys can take a look at those all right how do we read a capacitors values capacitors make it a lot easier than resistors it's not color bands or interpretation uh, the majority of the capacitors literally we read right off of them so if we look at the very first picture here the blue capacitor it says on there it's 10 microfarads okay capacitance is always going to be in farads so the F may or may not be there so in that first capacitor it doesn't show the F but it shows the micro or the mu symbol all right get used to using that mu symbol for you guys in class if you write a U I will accept that even though it's a mu it's fine I know what you're talking about don't confuse it with a lowercase or an uppercase M okay if we look at the bottom picture all right 0 0.47 microfarads now notice there's another piece on that one that has 0 0.400 volts or things like that so the voltage can vary on these well so some of them what we're going to use in our electronics all right the voltage is only going to be between 0 and 5 volts uh, where some of these you're going to use it on a 480 volt three phase system on a motor so different things like that all right that um, changes the physical aspect of the capacitor as well as the size of the capacitor depending on what amount of voltage that we are going to apply all right so the electrolytic capacitors all right they're the cylinders they're the easy ones it literally says on them what they are and it gives us the polarity so look at the bottom one again see how there's a negative sign there that's the negative lead uh, when we breadboard those all right a ceramic disc or a disc capacitor a little bit of interpretation but it's not as hard as the color code all right but it's still pretty easy if we take a look you're gonna see three digits and a letter three digits and a letter so the first two digits are just the digits the third digit is the number of zeros it has and the letter value is its tolerance same concept with tolerance as it is with the resistor all right that's not an exact value so there's a tolerance so that that capacitors capacitance value can vary by you know five percent one percent a quarter of a percent just based on the material that they use and how it was constructed 
So if we look at this capacitor here, the Advil looking disk capacitor on the left hand side here, we see 472K. So what does that mean? It's a 4 and a 7. The 2 tells us that it's two zeros and the K is the tolerance. So when we write this, we have 4700, so 4700. And that's, here's what's common amongst all of the disk capacitors. They are always all in picofarads. So you don't have to guess if it's a microfarad or a nanofarad, okay? This is 4,700 picofarads. K means plus or minus 10% tolerance. So all the disk capacitors are always in picofarads. So you keep that number. Don't write it as 47 and dot zero zero farads. It's 4,700 picofarads. So let's look at this one. We have a disk capacitor. You can pause the video real quick and see if you get it right, and uh, we can walk through it here. So it's a 331J. So what does that mean? The first digit is 3, the second digit is 3. The 1 tells us we have 1, 0, and the J has a, looking at the chart, plus or minus 5% tolerance. So these are nice, all right? So 330, and remember it's a disk capacitor, so it's in picofarads. All right, so that's why it's 330 lowercase p capital F for picofarads plus or minus 5%. All right, let's take a look at this guy here. It's 103K. All right, same concept here. So we're going to have one zero, the first two digits, with three zeros. So that's why it's going to be 10,000. One zero with three zeros is 10,000 picofarads. And then the K is plus or minus 10%. So these guys should be fairly easy to you on your homework uh, and your class assignment when we look at the recognition here. All right. So those are kind of the ones that we got to do different readings on. Um, these are going to be some common ones that we're going to use for displaying things. All right. So if we look at picture one, that's a seven segment display. Now, the seven segments is used to display certain numbers and letters. It cannot produce every letter of the alphabet, and it cannot produce um, you know, more than a single digit number. We do produce all of the numbers, and some of those could be considered letters and things like that. Now, there is a decimal, so that kind of makes it the eighth, uh, but we're going to do a whole project. We're going to have a whole lecture on all the different parts of a seven segment display. There's anodes and cathodes and, and their design, and that'll make sense kind of when we get there. Uh, it's either, you know, zero turns it on or one turns it on. But we're going to get there in electronics. In uh, picture two, those are called LED, light emitting diodes. Diode meaning that current can only flow in one direction. All right, so those are polarized. Notice if you physically look at each one of those, they have a long leg and a short leg. The short leg is the negative side. The long leg is the positive side. If you put the LED in backwards, your circuit will not work. Okay, And then I'll show you in class the actual body of the where it's red, yellow, green, and clear right there. There's actually a little smooth part. That, so if you cut the legs of the LED, you'll still know which is the negative side. But those are just diodes. We shoot current through them, and they produce light. A little different than the LED light bulbs you have in your house, but we're going to be working with those and doing a lot of breadboarding with them. We're going to get into using a lot of these common electronic components. So we refer to these as ICs, integrated circuits. Okay, now, we've got to take a look and understand what's going on here, and it'll make more sense when we solder some of these. Picture 1 and picture 2, those are not integrated circuits. Those are just chassis that your integrated circuit will sit in. So what will happen, because you don't want to solder, and solder is where we're going to actually physically connect circuits to a board. You don't want to solder your chips to the board because it will fry them because solder irons are very hot. So when we do that we use a chassis. So you can solder the chassis in first and then place your chip in once the solder is cooled. You're going to do that. We're going to solder multiple um, 
little breadboards that we're going to use in class. We're going to use our power supply that we're going to create. Uh, and you guys need to make sure that you solder all those correctly. Some of you will make the mistake and solder your chip to the board because you didn't read or follow directions or remember the fact that we need to put the chassis in first. So please start making a mental note now that you're going to solder the chassis and then put the chip in and the chip has to go in a certain way. All right, so that's picture one and two there. Picture three and four, okay? Notice these are all dip packages, dual inline packages, which means we have inputs and outputs on both sides and the IC is for integrated circuits. So anytime we talk about a dip IC, it's a dual inline package IC. So question three, that's a 14 pin. So if you count the little legs on that, there will be seven on each side. The majority of the circuits that we're gonna use are those. Okay, now, number four is an eight pin dip IC. Okay, so eight pin dual inline package integrated circuit. Those are gonna be the 555 timers that we work with. Notice if you count, there's four pins on each side. And they obviously get bigger. Okay, so you can look at picture eight, that's a 44 pin PLCC, okay? So all those different acronyms, you know, stand for different things in different packages. So if we look at SOIC, that's small outline integrated circuit, and then PLCC is plastic leaded chip carrier, all right? We're going to go over those as we move through class throughout the year so that you understand. We're, we use these mainly for breadboarding. Does that mean that you can open up a TV or a DVD player or your cable box and those will be in there? You will see those in there, yes. But mainly these chips are used for prototyping where we're going to breadboard them. And I know I keep throwing that term out there and you don't know what it is. We are going to cover that in class. But we are physically going to make circuits and make them work. All right. Most of the stuff in your phone, in your computer, and all the electronics we use don't quite look like this. They have the same properties. They function the exact same way. They are just very, very small. All right, that's the advantage of us having being able to have semiconductors and things like that and transistors. We can shrink those now and make them really, really small, and that's why they work in your electronics. The same way that these larger ones do when we breadboard. All right, last couple things here. We just need to go through. Uh, question one, not question one, picture one, okay, those are fuses. Those are protecting uh, electronic circuits normally. So what happens with a fuse is it's tough to see in there, and I'll pass some around in class. There is a small wire that goes through there. What happens is in how those protect circuits, those aren't like the circuit breakers in your house. We'll talk about those too. But these go in electronics uh, and things like that. What happens is if too much current goes through that wire, your fuse blows. Protecting the equipment, because it's easier for us to replace a 10 cent fuse than to replace all the electronic components on your board. So we use fuses as protective devices. It's literally a small wire that when it gets too much current, it snaps because current heats the wire up and expands it too much, and that's what makes it blow. It gets too hot and just blows up. Question, uh, picture two, I don't know why I keep saying question, I apologize for that, but picture two is a transistor. All right, that's how we do electronic switching. That When those came out, that changed everything we do with technology and how everything is that runs today on electronics. Those are probably one of the most integral and important pieces of electronics uh, that were developed that we can use. All right, you guys are going to use those. Some of you guys uh, will build some Tesla coils, things like that. Uh, more advanced class, if you ever take my MTSU class, we will get into the heart and soul of transistors and understand how electronic switching goes. Okay. Picture three is a diode. The sole purpose of a diode is to make sure that current only flows in one direction. Because sometimes when something's shutting down, you don't want your motor to turn into a generator and short a bunch of the equipment behind it. So you always protect your motor with a diode so the current can't backflow into your system and mess it up. Okay, we'll cover that more in the mechatronics courses a little later on. But this might be a little overwhelming, but you will know what all these components are. You will know how to use them uh, as far as breadboarding, making them. And later on, as you go through the program, when we troubleshoot, 
Uh, you're going to see these multiple times. Don't think you're one and done with these. All right, and make sure uh, you kind of go back and study through notes because we have the lecture quiz coming up.